You take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have Tom's Hit Parade. You're in spectacular-ish. There's a time you gotta go and show the opening title of your video, or viewers might get annoyed and click away. Greetings one and all, and welcome back to Tom's Hit Parade. Here we are charging on ahead with uh, part four in my five-part Tom's Hit Parade 2022 year-end spectacular-ish. Uh, don't miss the grand finale tomorrow, part five, where I will be counting down my 25 favorite studio albums of 2022. You're not going to want to miss that one. Uh, but as for today's video, we're going to be giving you uh, a little bit, as the clever song in my cold open kind of implied, a little bit of the good and a little bit of the bad. Uh, the, the good will be coming up in just a few minutes here, where I will be talking about, uh, I will be giving you the winners and runners-up in five categories of what I call my favorite odds and ends, and that is basically anything that isn't, wasn't a regular studio album uh, released in 2022. Uh, this is going to be my favorite holiday albums, live releases, compilations, soundtracks, and reissues. Lots of ground to cover today, but uh, first of all, before we do the good, uh, we're going to do the bad, or at least as bad as, or as negative as I care to get on my channel, and that is my five most disappointing albums of 2022. Now, pay attention to the name of that list. Uh, these are not the worst albums. I don't do worst albums because uh, I like to, uh, well, I basically just concentrate on, since I have, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier this week, I have a full-time job and I like to sleep eight hours a day, so I only have so much time to listen to music, so I tend to concentrate on the stuff that I know I'm going to like or that I think I'm going to like. And that's kind of where this list comes in. Uh, the five items uh, on the main part of this, the ranked part of this list, are going to be stuff that I used to own on physical format. Uh, you know, all of my year-end lists, I like to do stuff that I own on physical format, but these were ones that I bought, uh, and of course, if I'm going to spend the money to buy them, uh, I'm expecting or at least hoping that I'm going to like them. Unfortunately, as, as is kind of, that's the uh, beautiful thing about music in a way, is just as we don't know why we like the stuff that we like or that it connects to us, why it connects to us, uh, the same thing can happen with uh, stuff that we think we're going to like and for whatever reason just doesn't connect with us. And that is what is on the main part of this list. Uh, I'm also going to be doing be, be mentioning five honorable mentions. Uh, the first two of those will be the uh, two items that I'm two titles that I am not giving up on. I'm not uh, those are not in any any danger, at least not yet, not in the foreseeable future of being gotten rid of, uh, sold or traded to the record stores for trade credit. Uh, the other three honorable mentions will be stuff that is on the bubble, and I'm not sure if it's going to you know I'm going to give it more time obvious obviously, but they are. The possibility is there that they will be sold or traded into other stores, but of course the number five, the five ranked items, are long gone. They left my collection. Uh, disappointed, I was in in them, and again, this is not uh, these are not albums that I hated or didn't like. They're just ones that I didn't connect with. And if you connected with these albums and they are some of your favorites of the of the year, amazing. I'm glad you got something out of them that for whatever reason I couldn't get. So anyway, let's go ahead and start with the uh, two keeper honorable mentions, I guess you'd say, and that would be uh, Megan Trainer with the, her album Taking It Back and Charlie Puth's album Charlie. Uh, I like these artists. I've liked them both since the beginning, and yeah, it's just I, I expected more to be really enjoyable out of these albums. I was, you know, how do I put it? Um, these are good enough. I, I like them. It's just there wasn't anything really fresh in either of these albums for me to really enjoy. So, yeah, that was kind of disappointing, I gotta say. And uh, not sure if I can say any more about those. Maybe I can point out a couple of songs that I liked. Uh, Charlie Be Quiet was a very, uh, that, that was a good one. He's kind of, in a few of these songs, he did not, he kind of doesn't take himself too seriously. So that's a good thing. I always like an artist that does not take themselves too seriously. And uh, Light Switch was pretty good. And uh, why am I not, not finding the other one that I really liked? Oh, Loser. That was a good one. I like that one. And then, uh, yeah, as for uh, Megan Trainer taking it back, I can't really think of any uh, songs that really jump out at me. Uh, as I recall, Rainbow was really good. Um, 
sensitive featuring Scott Hoying of Pent Pentatonics when she fe when she brings him in to do that. Oh, and there was a song on here featuring Arturo Sandoval, who is a, a trumpeter, I believe, a jazz trumpeter. So it's like whenever a, a young artist like this brings on somebody who's, you know, a veteran and was Arturo Sandoval in his like 70s or 80s now, I think, you know, I got to give props to an artist who recognizes and pays tribute to the 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 old guard, so to speak, like kind of like uh, Charlie Puth did with his last album. He brought in James Taylor to uh, guest on the song. So but that's one of several reasons why I like Charlie. So anyway, yeah, uh, tried as I might, I uh, could not get into those. Maybe they will still grow on me in the coming year. Who knows? And now for uh, as for the three on the bubble um, uh, honorable mentions, first one is going to go to Rex Orange County with his album. Who cares? I really I like the songs just as much as on his previous album Pony. It's just the uh, <clears throat> I found it difficult to go back to listen to this album since the uh, the allegations of service surfaced against him. Um, I guess time will tell as to how those work out, uh, whether he uh, acquits himself, gets himself acquitted of those, or uh, or, or whatever happens uh, with them. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, sometimes it. As you've seen me talk about a few times on my channel, there are some ways that you can separate the art from the artist, and there are some ways that you kind of can't. And uh, this is one of those uh, cases where, I don't know, I find it a little difficult. And then again, it also depends on the artist. So, you know, like Michael Jackson, who, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of those allegations came around after he passed away. But his music is just so inseparable and was such a part of my youth that, you know, he's hard to really... I can't really surgically remove him from my listening. So, but with Rex Orange County, it can be a different story. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Like I said, for the reasons that I always already just said, I'm not sure if that's uh, how he's going to, uh, what his long-term future in my collection will be. So, and then as for the other two, yeah, the other two on the bubble honorable mentions, uh, they're actually both country-related titles. Uh, we have Breland. I really like this guy. Um, he mixes uh, hip hop and contemporary R and B elements with country, which I mean, I always like uh, artists who kind of you know want to stretch genre boundaries and blend one genre into another. Um, just the, the songs, the songs have been having trouble sticking with me. That's all. I, that's the only way I can put it. Uh, you know, he's he's a good artist, a good uh, 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 vocalist, and all that. Just. Uh, yeah, not sure. As I said, I will give these uh, repeated listens uh, until they either stop growing on me, or I don't know, or, or I just get plain sick of them. I don't know. But anyway, yeah. So Breland is still on the fence, as is Brett Eldridge. Um, I believe it was uh, Keegan from K Man Reviews first brought my attention to this album, and uh, for the reasons that uh, he specified, yes, Brett Eldridge has a gorgeous voice, a fantastic voice, uh, which is kind of front and center in all these songs, and he mixes, he's, he's got kind of a soul element to, to several of these songs, uh, but kind of the same thing with Breland. A, a lot of the songs, they sound good when you're listening to them, but I have trouble recalling them an hour or so after I've listened to the album. So yeah, remains to be seen, as with the other honorable mentions, as to whether uh, he sticks with me. And I may check out some of Brett Eldridge's uh, older albums to see if there's anything in there that uh, that I might uh, enjoy perhaps more than this album here. Oh, this album, by the way, was uh, uh, Songs About You. Well, yeah, it's his current his album from 2022. Yes, These are the disappointments from 2022. <laughs> Duh. Anyway, and now on to the primary list of my most disappointing albums of 2022. I will put the cover images here in the corner, since I actually no longer have the albums. And as I said at the beginning, you know, don't go flaming me or roasting me in the comments. Uh, I, it's not that I hated these albums. They just, I just couldn't connect with them. Uh, number five is Patient Number Nine by Ozzy Osbourne. Now, I actually have, uh, and I still own, uh, his previous album, Ordinary Man. I really, really enjoyed that one. For some, re some reason, Patient Number Nine just, just did not have the same staying power for me, and I don't know why. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I stuck with it for what, uh, a month, six weeks. And it just, it just could not, it just didn't grow on me anymore. And I, I knew that it was done. I had to stop trying. So, uh, yeah, 
is a shame. You know, Ozzy is a, a legendary artist. He's put out some amazing stuff in the past. Yeah, and I will probably feel really guilty if this ends up being his last album. But uh, who knows? Uh, anyway, and maybe at some point, I it's always possible I could come back to any of these albums later on, and they could suddenly click, click with me. That's happened before with albums from the past, so who knows? Anyway, uh, number four on my list of disappointments of the year is Unlimited Love by Red Hot Chili Peppers. I know it's a lot of people's, it's on a lot of people's favorites lists. And, you know, the Chili Peppers are amazing. They're an amazing group, uh, fantastically talented musically, and uh, um, Anthony Kiedis' vocals, vocals talent is great. Uh, I mean, Flea is one of the all-time great bass, bassists of all time, let's face it. But, uh, yeah, and this happened with at least one other recent Chili Peppers album. For some reason, I could not get into it. It couldn't. It did not stick with me. But uh, the the uh, the previous Rick Rubin albums from the what, what was it? The early '90s, late '80s, early '90s. I've loved them for years, and I've got them in my collection. I've had them in my collection for years. So yeah, I don't know what it is. Uh, you know, a couple of great singles that uh, you know stuck with me, but. And I still like those songs. It's just, you know, the entire rest of the album. And when you only like two or three songs out of an album that's that long, you know, what can you do? It's kind of a losing battle. So, yes, unfortunately, Unlimited Love by Red Hot Chili Peppers just uh, could not, uh, did not grow on me, and I had to uh, trade it in at the store. So number three on my list, and this one also hurt, well, all five of these hurt in a way, in varying degrees. But to number three on my list is Gold Rush Kid by George Ezra. Love his first two albums. I've had them pretty much since the beginning, since they came out, I think. And so, yes, I picked up his uh, latest album, Gold Rush Kid, I think without even... No, I think I heard the first single. And, uh, yeah, liked it for the first few listens, and then it just ended up shrinking on me quite a bit. And, uh, you know, his voice is just... And you know me, I like unique, distinctive voices, and George Ezra has one of the most unique ones around. It's just the songs just were not memorable. I could not, they could not stick with me at all. So, sad to say, the first George Ezra album that was a disappointment to me. So, yes, sad to say that. My number two, my runner-up for disappointing album of the year is AM Gold by Train. And this one, you know, when I, re when I heard that it was a kind of a nostalgia trip back to 70s Yacht rock, even though I hate that term, uh, you know, seventies pop and stuff like uh, what, like America and Bread and all that stuff. I was on board, and I actually their previous album, "A Girl, a Bottle, a Boat," was one of the most boring albums I remember picking up in the history of <laughs> of my music listening careers. It was just terrible, and so I kind of held out hope because I have a few of Train's, or a couple of Train's earlier albums, and I really enjoy them. Drops of Jupiter is one of my favorite albums from its time. Uh, but yeah, and another reason this hurts is um, because Train was one of my sister's favorite groups. So, you know, to not connect with something that she enjoyed that I used to be able to connect with is, is a little painful, actually. So, and yeah, it's, uh, I was kind of expecting, since uh, John Mayer's, most recent album, uh, Sob Rock, was kind of a similar homage to 80s soft rock. Uh, I was kind of expecting to be won over uh, as much as I was with his album. But yeah, uh, and same thing with pretty much all the other albums on this list. The songs are fun when you listen to them. 20 minutes later, they're out of your brain and you can't remember them. So yeah, very terribly disappointing. Uh, but the most disappointing album for me, for 2022, was Higher by Michael Bublé. The first Michael Bublé album that I was just, that just fell completely flat for me. <laughs> yes, it wasn't Bublé, it fell flat like soda. <laughs> Terrible pun, I know. But uh, yeah, I mean, his voice is just as good as it ever was. It's, I guess, maybe just the Michael Bublé thing is just kind of wearing out for me. That's all I can figure. Because uh, yeah, I've got, what, five or six of his albums? And I, I think when I realized this one didn't, uh, didn't connect with me, I think I also reevaluated the one before that, and I think I got rid of that one. I'm not sure, but I think I did. So, but yeah, he's got some great albums, some great, great songs, uh, CDs that I am keeping in my collection of his, but sad to say, higher 
was not one of them, and it uh, disappointed me. Sorry to say. So, yeah, I guess that is my list of my most disappointing albums of 2022. Okay, now that the bad stuff is done and out of the way, let's go ahead and get back to the good stuff, shall we? Uh, in this half of the video, I will be talking about uh, my winners and runners-up in five categories, which I call my odds and ends. Uh, I used to call them fringe categories, which that makes them sound like they're really weird, off-the-wall, bizarre uh, releases. But in truth, these are basically just anything that wasn't a regular studio album in 2022. We are talking live albums, reissues, soundtracks, holiday albums, and compilations. So yes, I will be giving you a runner-up and a winner in each of those categories, because that's basically all that I bought in 2022 releases from any of those uh, criteria. So they're, they're kind of, well, they're kind of winners and runners-up by default, even though I did choose which was which, the winner and the runner-up. But anyway, uh, and we're going to start with the compilations, uh, because the runner-up that I have in my compilations category, it's kind of dicey. I'm really, really stretching the definition of a compilation, because this is more of a box set, because it's six discs, uh, and I normally like to limit anything that I put in my year-end lists to um, releases that are, at the very, very most, three discs. I like to keep it to two discs, but occasionally there's going to be a really neat, neat one that's three discs. So yeah, yeah, and this one, as I mentioned, has six discs. Uh, it's five CDs and one DVD. And But when you go to the, uh, the dictionary definition of compilation, which is a new package that is made up of uh, items from individual previous releases, then that's what this is. This is a compilation by that definition. So in a way, I'm not cheating. And and I'm also not cheating because this is not my winner, it's my runner-up. But anyway, to make a long story even longer, let's go ahead and tell you what this is. My runner-up for compilation of the year is The Complete Picture, Chesney Hawks, uh, 1991 to 2012. Now, Chesney Hawks uh, is a uh, pop singer uh, from the UK. Well, he started out as a teen pop singer. This is how he looked in 1991. And uh, he ended up as a pretty darn good um, adult singer-songwriter. So, And that's one thing that this uh, set does a good job at, is kind of tracing his evolution from teen pop singer to adult singer-songwriter. And yes, this has all four of his studio albums, a disc of rarities and remixes, demos, and all that stuff. And the DVD has music videos, um, uh, concert footage, and TV appearances on it. So a cool box set. I'm going to talk about the first album uh, for a few minutes, because it is kind of unusual. Uh, in the UK, I'm digging into the box set here, in the UK his debut album was called Buddy Song, and I was stupid and didn't grab the American version off the shelf to show it to you. Uh, <laughs> duh. I, I did everything else for preparation, but I didn't do that. Uh, in America, his debut album was called The One and Only, uh, because that was the most popular song off of it. And the reason it was called Buddy Song in the UK is because it serves as the de facto soundtrack to, I believe it was just a TV movie in the UK called Buddy Song. Um, he played Buddy, and Roger Daltrey of The Who played Buddy's dad. So, yes, Roger Daltrey acted. I, I think he's. it's known that he's been an actor. I don't think that's the only thing he's acted in, but uh, it was kind of cool. And I hadn't watched that movie, Buddy Song, until just about two months ago. It's actually available for free on YouTube. The quality is pretty bad because I don't think there was ever a uh, an official video release of it. So you're, you're looking at a VHS copy of a TV broadcast, I think. Uh, so yeah, the quality is not great, but it's an entertaining little movie. And, uh, you know, for the first time, I understood how the context, the context of how the songs were presented in, in the movie for the first time ever. And I, I've had his, uh, the American version, the one and only, a CD for since the early 90s, since basically since it came out. So, But yes, very entertaining. I am uh, not sorry at all that I picked it up. It was fun. Anyway, my uh, the winner for my favorite compilation of 2022 is, now that's what I call pride. In a way, how could it not be, right? Uh, but yes, it was kind of, it, it's kind of cool. I don't think I heard about this at all. I saw it on the racks at, was it Walmart or... Uh, Maybe it was uh, Barnes & Noble or somewhere else. Uh, I just saw it sitting there on the racks, and I thought, hey, it's about time. I mean, yeah, the, the uh, Now That's What I Call Music uh, people, they put out two volumes of Now That's What I Call Yacht Rock before they put out one volume of Now That's What I Call Pride. So, go figure. Anyway, uh, 
you see, all, all of the songs that you would expect are here. Uh, Born This Way by Lady Gaga and, uh, oh, where's that one? Um, oh, I'm Coming Out by Diana, or, uh, yeah, Diana Ross. And of course, uh, some disco songs, of course. You can't have, you can't have a Pride album without disco. And uh, Rainbow by Casey Musgraves. Beautiful by Christina Aguilera. Uh, uh, Aguilera. Beautiful by Christina Aguilera. Yes. And so, yeah. Lots of great stuff on here. And there was a, there are a couple songs that I can't think about think of off the top of my head. Oh, and another great thing about this CD is it has, I think, only the second appearance of on physical form of any song off of Lil Nas X's Montero album. In this case, the title track, Montero, Call Me, Call Me By Your Name, is on it's on a CD. How about that? You know, thank, thanks, Nas, for never putting that album on out, out on physical format. I still hate him for that. Uh, but anyway. Yes, uh, a, a cup, as I was going to say, a couple of songs that uh, I would have thought should have been on here are missing, but uh, maybe they're saving those for now. That's what I'll call Pride 2. We'll wait and see, I guess. But anyway, so yes, that is my favorite compilation of 2022. Now on to the holiday albums. Uh, you know, I, I only really bought, I think, just two, these two holiday albums uh, new as new releases during 2022, so... As I said, they're kind of winners by default, or winners and runners-up. Uh, but let, yeah, the uh, runner-up for my favorite holiday album is A Very Backstreet Christmas by Backstreet Boys. Uh, and it kind of surprised me when I realized that they had not released a holiday album until 2022. Yeah, NSYNC jumped on it uh, way back in the day. They put out a holiday album as their second album release, I think, in the States. But yeah, Backstreet Boys, for whatever reason, waited until this year to put one out and uh yeah it's very fun and enjoyable their their harmonies their vocal harmonies of course are of course as great as they've always been and let's face it it's the backstreet boys uh the title was a in my opinion it was kind of a lazy title i mean in the recent years we've had a very casey christmas and a very a very trainer christmas i think and then uh, uh darren chris I mean, at least he was a little clever. It was a play on his name. Came out with a very, a very daring Christmas. You know, so let let's ramp up the originality, guys, with the album titles, okay? But other than that, um, fun stuff. I mean, all the all the classics are on here. Um, Have yourself a merry little Christmas. The Christmas song. Uh, I'll be home for Christmas. They do a cover of Wham's Last Christmas. That's good stuff. And uh, Feliz Navidad. So they do a pretty good version of that one as well. Um, and they have a couple of, I think, a couple of uh, original songs. Happy Days, which I don't remember. It, it's not the TV theme song. Uh, and It's Christmas Time Again. I'm not sure if that is a cover or not. But, uh, yeah. A very enjoyable album if you're looking for the classic, good old, classic old-timey Christmas songs. Uh, but my favorite one is uh, It's Christmas with a Twist. This is, uh, it, it's originality makes it my favorite holiday album of 2022. And that is Holidays Around the World by Pentatonix. Sorry about the uh, glare there for the reflection from the screen. But yes, um, as the title suggests, they do kind of an international... Uh, they, they take international Christmas songs or they take American, you know, popular Western Christmas songs and give them uh, world music arrangements. So yes, very, very fun listen. Uh, Kid on Christmas, I think, is a... Uh, an original, and that features Megan Trainer, and uh, they have a couple of other, uh, a few other features on here. Uh, it, it's been a couple months since I listened to this, but uh, yeah, and they they actually do a cover of Last Christmas, but uh, yes, several good arrangements. I wish I had taken notes so I could tell you, but there were a couple of uh, songs on here where the arrangement is they put a twist on it. It's it's a kind of an arrangement you wouldn't expect. So if you have not listened to this. And if, if your appetite for holiday music goes year-round and you can listen to it in January or February, I recommend putting this on and giving it a listen. Uh, very, very interesting. One of the most unique holiday albums to come along in years. Uh, and so, yeah, excellent stuff. And, of course, Pentatonix uh, themselves, they are still at the top of their game uh, with great stuff. And they bring some, some uh, American artists and some uh, international artists in as um, features on here. So, yeah. Very, very good stuff. Highly recommended. As is uh, taking uh, drinking water regularly is also high, highly recommended. So, excuse me for a moment. 
How's that for a clever segue? Anyway, <clears throat> on to the next category, which is my favorite and second favorite soundtrack albums of 2022. Uh, not a lot of introdu introductory stuff to say here. My runner-up for favorite soundtrack is Top Gun Maverick. Even though I have not yet seen the movie, I know it's on streaming, and my streaming box is literally, I'm looking at it right there, so I could watch it at any, any time, but I haven't watched it yet. But uh, yeah, one of the big draws on this was, of course, the presence of Lady Gaga. I like Gaga. She's, you know, I've, I've loved her for years. And so yeah, her original songs on here are, are excellent. Uh, of course, uh, you know, to be totally honest, to be brutally honest, this does not hold a candle to the original sound, uh, Top Gun soundtrack album from the 80s, What Could. I mean, you know, the 80s was l definitely the golden years of, or the, the golden age of movie soundtracks, uh, song-based movie soundtracks. But uh, yeah, still plenty of good stuff on here. And uh, I was curious at the credit, uh, music by Harold Faltermeyer, Lady Gaga, and Hans Zimmer. So I'm kind of wondering, did Lady Gaga play more of a role in the composition of the music, the like the instrumental music, or what? Or, or did, was that strictly Harold Faltermeyer and Hans Zimmer? I don't know, but anyway. I guess the Top Gun anthem that Harold Faltermeyer wrote for the original film uh, reappears in this one, so that's kind of fun to hear that. And uh, yeah, and the instrumental stuff by Hans Zimmer is pretty good, too. I, or do I have any of Hans Zimmer's other stuff? I don't think I do, actually. I might be confusing him with uh, somebody else, but anyway. Good soundtrack. Um, is it a good movie? I assume it ha it is. It's it's a hit movie. It's been getting lots of good praise and stuff. So, uh, some at some point very soon I will watch the movie. I promise. But my favorite soundtrack. Oops, sorry, I dropped it. My favorite soundtrack of 2022, and this one caught me by surprise because I didn't think I was going to like it when I watched the movie, but uh, I kind of turned around and uh, really really enjoy it. Elvis. God, sorry about the reflection of the uh, tablet screen in there. But anyway, yes, um, at first, when I first saw the movie and listened to the music they had in it, I was completely bewildered and befuddled and kind of turned off a couple of times. I wasn't sure what uh, Boz Lerman was uh, trying to accomplish with the music, but then I eventually realized he was bringing contemporary, you know, hip-hop and R&B in to show it was as kind of a through line of how Elvis influenced popular music back in his time. Elvis brought a lot of black influences into uh, American popular music, which at the time was very, very white. So yes, so this kind of, you know, by bringing a lot of these hip hop acts in, into the soundtrack, and some of them were kind of uh, sampling, some of them lightly, some of them heavily sampling Elvis music, kind of shows uh, how Elvis basically influenced everything going forward. So, yes, very, very clever, I thought, on uh, Boz Lerman's part, or, or whoever had ultimate say in the music. I don't know if it was Boz Lerman or just the music supervisor for the movie, but anyway. Uh, yes, and of course, uh, Elvis songs, you know, I, I am much more a fan of uh, early period Elvis, Elvis than of any other period. And of course, the, uh, you know, you've got Elvis, you know, archive recordings of Elvis himself singing songs. And in some of the, uh, some of the other songs, um, God, what's his name? Austin Butler. Uh, sings the songs as well. So, and you've got uh, Stevie Nicks and Chris Isaac duet on a song in here, and uh, and Casey Musgraves sings "I Can't Help Falling in Love." I love that one. I love Casey. Uh, so yeah, I'm just in all sorts of artists that you wouldn't have, uh, you wouldn't expect, would appear in a movie like this. So, and the movie was fantastic, by the way. If you have not seen it, you've got to see it. Austin Butler blew me away as Elvis. I mean, fantastic performance. So yeah, <clears throat> my favorite soundtrack of the year, Elvis. And probably my favorite movie of the year because that's almost the only movie I watched. <laughs> I'm not a huge movie guy. I, I don't know why it is, but why that is. But anyway, uh, as that is it for the favorite soundtrack releases. Now we're going on to the favorite reissues, my favorite reissues of 2022. And this one was kind of hard to do. I Depending on my mood, mood day, day uh, from one day to the next, I will flip flop these and make the winner the runner up and the runner up the winner. But uh, today I'm going to stick with this um, structuring of it. My runner up for favorite reissue of the year is the 10th anniversary edition of Jake Bugg's studio debut studio album, self titled. 
Uh, yes, I, I wasn't going to get this for a long time because I have the Japanese version of this album, uh, which has a couple of bonus tracks, and I, you know, I've never been a huge fan of, you know, a lot of the extras. Almost never remixes or demos, you know, unless there's something really, really different from the finished product. You know, B-sides I like, uh, but yeah, this album has the first disc. It's, this is a three-disc set, by the way. The first disc is the remaster of the original album. The second disc is uh, packed with B-sides and uh, B-sides and remixes. Uh, 18 songs on that disc, so it is literally packed to the brim with uh, that stuff. And the funny thing is, it has the two B-sides, the two Japanese exclusive songs that are on the version that I have, but these are, you know, qualified by uh, Jason Hart version. So I don't know if these versions are the same versions as the ones on my disc. So I haven't, you know, compared them side by side yet. So yeah. if not, then it's a good thing that I've kept the Japanese version of the CD. But anyway, and uh, the third disc is actually a live album, uh, live at the Royal Albert Hall. And it also features, let's see, uh, Michael Kiwanuka and Johnny Marr on a few of the tracks. So yes, you get a full concert album, a full disc of B-sides, along with the original studio album remastered. So it's if you like Jake Bug and you've got a little extra cash in your wallet, I would recommend this. Uh, it's got, it has a lot of uh, uh, stuff that makes it worth the extra purchase. So yes, very, very good stuff. And I cannot believe it's been 10 freaking years since, well, technically now it's 11 years uh, since uh, Jake Bug sprang onto the scene. So, but I've got every one of his albums, and they're just excellent. I, he seems to keep getting better uh, all the time. As you re might recall, his most recent album was my number one album of last year. So, there you go. anyway, but uh, the my number one favorite reissue, as it stands right now, uh, of 2022 is Spider Man, the uh, 20th anniversary. Another anniversary I can't believe has gone by already. 20th anniversary score. Uh, remastered and expanded edition by Danny Elfman. Yes, this is a three-disc set as well. Yes, both reissues are three discs. Which, I mean, if, if you're going to have a reissue on your uh, countdown, it's probably going to be more than two discs, let's face it. But yes, I, I've loved the score. I've loved the score album from the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie uh, more than the song-based song soundtrack uh, for the, the whole time ever since the movie came out. Yes, and as soon as the movie came out, I had to buy the score album. I didn't buy the soundtrack album until way later. Uh, but yes, the first disc has uh, the original score remastered, along with a couple of bonus tracks. And yeah, the bonus tracks on disc one are, and I didn't realize this, on the song-based soundtrack, there are two selections from the score that appear in slightly different edits than, on, than they appear on the original score album. So that's what these two bonus tracks are, is the uh, the soundtrack album edits of those two score pieces. A, a trivia note for those of you who don't get into that kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, disc two, uh, yeah, yeah. as I said, disc one was the original album version, along with the two bonus tracks, and discs two and three are the score presentation as, as it was originally heard in the movie. So, uh, and of course there are a bunch of uh, alternate takes and uh, that kind of stuff, and uh, unreleased uh, stuff on this set. Fantastic set. I waited. Uh, I actually didn't realize that La La Land Records was putting this out until, uh, what was it, just a few months ago they announced it, and like a month later, I think it was on December 5th, was when it was actually uh, put out for uh, for shipping. You could pre-order it early, and then uh, it shipped on, on December 5th, so I've only had it for about a month, so fantastic stuff. I, I love James Horner, and I love the scores from the Spider-Man films. Excellent. So, uh, this is going to be a long video, sorry. Um, the final category is live albums, and I'm going to try and get through these, but I've got a lot to say about the winner for the live album category. First of all, though, the runner-up for live albums is Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers Live at the Fillmore. This is the two-CD edition. I, I, I like Tom Petty a lot, but I don't love him enough that I wanted to spring for the four-disc set. But uh, this is, yeah, the two-disc set is fun enough for me. It's just fantastic. I mean, Two discs packed to the rafters with... Uh, there's actually probably more covers songs than there are Tom Petty originals on these things. And fantastic. And and the little uh, between songs, you know, little banter with the audience and stuff. And there's one on here uh, with uh, 
what's it called? The Internet, whatever that is. So this was done in 1997, probably before Tom Petty had ever logged on to the Internet. So uh, unless he was just being silly with us and was just joking, the Internet, whatever that is. But anyway, uh, a fun little, you know, uh, artifact of its time. But yes, I mean, the musicianship obviously is superlative. I mean, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers were arguably at the top of their game in the late 90s. But yes, so enjoyable. This actually might have, might be, this is enjoyable enough that I might think about uh, springing for the four disc set. So uh, yeah, excellent stuff. Even if you're, even if you're a casual fan of Tom Petty, I would recommend at least the two disc set of that. It's great. So <clears throat> one more drink, sorry. I must keep hydrated, you know. So anyway, now one of the best, I'm probably leaving the best for last here, my favorite live recording of 2022, and this has a good, great story to go along with it, is John Williams' The Berlin Concert. Yes, this is uh, was recorded back at the end of 2021 during John Williams' 90th birthday celebration. Yes, the guy is 90 years old, uh, with the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. And uh, it's got all of his, I mean, this program, as well as uh, he put out a release a year earlier with the Vienna Philharmonic. And yes, I bought both of them. And what for one reason, though, is uh, there are only about five uh, pieces that are redundant between the two albums. So yes, uh, all very different um, uh, programs between the two releases. But yes, this is just fantastic, as is the other one. Uh, John Williams, of course, as you know, has done the scores for the Star Wars films, Indiana Jones, Jurassic Park, Superman, uh, E.T., uh, and several others I can't think of right now. It's just, you know, I grew up listening to his music, soundtracking my favorite movies from my youth. And uh, yeah, there's a very, very special meaning uh, that this album has for me. <laughs> cannot get the glare out of there. Um, one, one reason, and it's a big reason why I love this one and the Vienna album so much is because they remind me of when I went to see John Williams performing with the Eugene Symphony Orchestra. And it was the first concert that I went to after my sister passed away. It was only about a month after my sister passed away. And it was, I mean, it's almost a cliche to say that music is healing. Music has healing properties. But, and I never really believed that until that night. I mean, he performed very similar program to what you hear on this one and the Vienna album, uh, just pretty much packed with his uh, classic soundtrack themes, movie themes and stuff. And it was so incredibly therapeutic and healing for me. Uh, it was only about a month after my sister had passed away. And so it was it was so much what I needed at the time. And so, yes, this, so listening to these albums uh, takes me back to that night, for one thing. And not to mention... It's John Williams' movie music, so hello. It's going to be, it's going to kick ass, no matter what. And uh, so, yeah, that's one reason amongst many why this is my favorite uh, live album of the year. And oh, one thing that's kind of funny on this, I, I think it was the Berlin one, uh, was that he uh, does little introductions to some of the pieces, you know, little spoken word passages between the uh, compositions. And at one point he talks about uh, this being his first trip to Berlin. It's like the guy's 90 years old, and he hadn't been to Berlin until, you know, being going there to perform with, for the concert. So that was, that was kind of an interesting thing. It's like, and it's like, you're never too old to not have seen everything. So that's, I, I don't know if I'm uh, communicating that effectively or not, but, uh, you know, the, the, the reason why I'm in, kind of enchanted with that is, you know, even even a guy like John Williams hasn't seen everything. Maybe maybe that's the the way I'm supposed to be phrasing it. But I don't know. Anyway, uh, stop me from going on any longer than I am. Uh, so yes, those are my favorite uh, li my lists for well, one favorite and some favorites, some least favorites lists for today's video. Be sure and stay tuned for tomorrow's video, the big one, the grand finale, where I talk about my 25 favorite studio albums of 2022, along with eight honorable mentions. But for now, that'll do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends and give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comment section below. 
Also scroll down to the description for the links to my Twitter and Instagram feeds and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet and browse my past videos and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you tomorrow. And remember, life's too short to be a music snob.